Okay, welcome everyone and welcome to the very first session of the 2022 Biocontrol Technical Workshop Series under the ASEAN Fall Army Worm Action Plan. And we're very happy to be hosting this series in partnership with CABI. Uh, my name is Alison Watson and I'll be moderating the session. Uh, and we have a fantastic presentation lined up. I'm really, really excited with what's going to be presented. And we have some fantastic speakers joining us as well that you can see on screen or people helping out with questions that you may have in the Q&A. So before we start, I'd just like to go over how we interact in today's session. Um, it's really important to use this opportunity to ask all those burning questions you have around BT biopesticides because you have the experts here. So please put all your questions, the Q&A, in the Q&A box uh, and we'll try and move through those. Um, it, it's much easier if you use that rather than the chat because it means I can see all the questions and make sure that they are asked. But please use the chat box to introduce yourself. Uh, if you have any resources that you would like to share, um, also you can um, post them in there and you can also make comments in there as well. Just, just be polite. Uh, and if you'd like to congratulate one of the speakers or, or say something, please do so as well. Now, just a reminder that this is the first session of the series. We had a very big series last year, so we thought we would this time uh, do another series, um, but really focus in on that uh, specific technologies and approaches and really look at practical information and resources in the field. So our session today on BT biopesticides, for example, has a lot of practical information. It's also going to be followed up by a second session on June 30 that will take us into the field to get a closer look of how to use BT in crops uh, with field examples. And you'll be able to register if you haven't already uh, at our events page. Now, just a reminder as well, if you've got any further questions after this, or you want to share some work that you're doing in particular uh, in relation to BT biopesticides, you can participate in our forum and you just really have to go to our ASEANFAWaction.org website, go to community, click on forum, you'll see a little forum there under biocontrol and you can actually ask your questions in there and we'll actually get some of our experts to answer those. So. Don't worry if your question doesn't get answered today, um, there is room for it there as well. And we do issue certificates of participation, um, but you do have to participate in our forum discussion if you want a, particip a participation certificate. Now, just a quick introduction. We're really lucky to have three speakers today join us through the session. We've got Dr. Roma Gwynn, an independent international expert on biocontrol uh, and lead of our upcoming biocontrol masterclass research and regula regulatory series. Dr. Daniel Zomik, technical development specialist for the Biorational Crop Protection Division at Valent Biosciences. And Fang Zhang, regional director, the East and Southeast Asia of CABI. And he'll be joining us at the end to give us a bit of a summary of of the session. Now, before we start, we want to find out a little bit about who's in the room. So we've got four questions and we wanted to find out a little bit about your knowledge. So I'm just going to launch the first poll. Hopefully you can see that. I'm afraid I don't think our panelists can um, participate in the poll. So sorry there if you've got a burning uh, <laughs> desire. Um, but look, you've got four questions. Um, you should be able to see that. Can people see that coming up? Yep, I've got some, some people answering. So the first one is what stakeholder group best describes the organization you work for? So you've got civil society, government, international organizations, research, um, academia, uh, and other for those people uh, who are also very keen on biocontrol but don't fall into those categories. Uh, and look, here's a really interesting one. We wanted to know who in the room has used any microbiome biopesticides before? Okay, we're getting a real mix there. Uh, and have you used BT before? Another kind of interesting results. I'm getting a preview here, so I'm, I'm, I'm sneaking into the answers already. But the fourth one is, have you actually treated for fall armyworm uh, with any technique or approach? We really just want to know that, have you actually been in there and, and been involved in trying to control fall armyworm? Um, so that's getting a mixture of results too. I'm gonna give everyone maybe 10 more seconds. You've got a few questions to answer there. We've got 70 replies so far, so that's pretty good. So keep them coming, everyone. And we've also got more joining the room. So we're up to 138, so that's really good. It's great to see everyone.
and I'm going to end the poll very shortly and I'm going to share the results so hopefully you can all see that Daniel you've got a bit of a nod to can you see the results so what stakeholder group we've got 45% from private sector there, um, but strong government uh, as well, and then a mix of others. Nice to see the research organisations. Have you used any microbiome biopesticide? Never, 33%, occasionally 31, and often 17. Uh, so we've got a bit of a mix actually there as well. So that's good to see. Have you used BT? Oh, here we go we've got quite a nice spread never is 40 percent. so we've got lots in the room that are really wanting to know what is the deal with bt and how can we use it and then what does it do uh, and then we've got 20 percent there that often so i think you're going to have some questions daniel from both ends of the spectrum and have you treated for full armyworm this is interesting too wow okay 54 percent no but 46 percent yes um, so that's fantastic. So that's going to be a really good discussion. So look, there's lots of questions I can see already coming through, probably. So please ask those in the Q&A as we go through. Now, thanks for doing that, everyone. That sort of sets us up for a good discussion. And it also sets us up introducing, uh, introducing our speaker, Daniel Zomit from uh, Valent Biosciences, where he is responsible for commercial support and product training on the BT portfolio. Uh, Valent Biosciences is one of the largest BT manufacturers in the world with products registered in more than 65 countries. He's going to be joined by uh, Dr. Christopher Moses and I also see Katie uh, there as well from Valent Biosciences. Christopher is actually the birational expert for Sumitomo Chemical, which is the parent company to Valent Biosciences in Asia. So they will be helping to answer any technical questions that come through. Um, so please keep them coming through because they are there and ready to answer your questions. Um, so without further ado, I'd really like to introduce Daniel, um, bring a wealth of experience. It's great to have you today and we're really interested to have this presentation on the management of fall armyworm with sprayable BT. So welcome Daniel. I'm just going to turn my video off and I'm going to ask you if you could load your presentation. All right. Thank you so much. I think you have to uh, stop sharing your screen. Yep. Perfect. Here we go. All right, you can see it? Yep, just need to maximize it. All right, there we go. Well, excellent. Um, you know, I, I, wanna, I wanna start by thanking um, uh, Allison and the um, uh, the Grow Asia organization just for this this great opportunity to um, to introduce you all or um, maybe remind you about some interesting things about uh, Bacillus thuringiensis. Um, today, more than ever, uh, commercial BTs are a really important tool, uh, not only for for managing fall armyworm but also for other caterpillar pests. Um, as um, as, as society moves towards um, a desire for using uh, safer, lower risk um, uh, pesticides, um, having products like BTs on the market is, is really critically important for our future. And so I'd like to start uh, maybe stepping back a little bit with just a reminder about what a biocontrol is. Um, we are very much in a very um, distinct, uh, in a distinct group here in biocontrol um, in which uh, biopesticides are defined as maybe macroorganisms like beneficial insects, microbes like what we'll talk about today, uh, natural substances like um, plant extracts and semiochemicals like pheromones. And uh, actually Roma gave an excellent uh, introduction to biocontrols. Uh, if you go to this link here, the um, uh, Fall Armyworm Action website uh, in the video section, there's a really good introduction to um, all of these different uh, biocontrol tools. But today we're gonna focus really just on the microorganisms. And in general, there are um, three general classes of microbial uh, bioprotectants. Uh, the first are fungi. Uh, these are microbes like Metaresium or Bavaria bassiana, uh, bacterium like BTs, or viruses. Now, this image here on the left um, shows the different um, the different ways in which these um, uh, these different classes operate. So, for example, um, BTs. Um, BTs and viruses uh, exclusively work through ingestion, while fungi can um, 
uh, can bind to the, uh, well, fungi will um, attach to the outside of the insect and actually invade them from the outside in. And that's really um, an important aspect about uh, microbial biocontrols. It's that um, they operate very differently from uh, chemical controls. So for example, microbial biocontrols are microorganisms that may or may not have secondary compounds, while chemical controls are very defined active ingredients. Microbial biocontrols are often have a complex mode of action. So for example, BTs, we'll talk about it as a stomach poison today. Well, chemical controls have a very singular mode of action. Uh, for example, having a very discrete target site. Microbial biocontrols uh, can be really difficult to define what the active substance is, as it's the concoction of lots of different things. Well, chemical controls always have a very clearly defined active ingredient, uh, active substance. Microbial biocontrols also uh, oftentimes are slow to have its effect, uh, slow to kill the insect, while chemical controls can be very quick, having, um, you know, very good knockdown activity. And so um, what I think it's important to mention here and what I want to draw you to is the fact that when we're talking about uh, microbial biocontrols and about BT specifically, um, I want you to, to think about them not in the same vein as you would um, traditional chemical controls, but to consider that it is a living organism and it, and it operates within the insect in a different way. And why it's important to keep that in mind is because that also then uh, helps inform us about how to use the products most effectively and to, um, to, to use that, that, um, that natural mode of action to, to our benefit. So Bacillus thuringiensis is very much a targeted bacterial disease of caterpillars. If you look on the left-hand side here, this is a, um, a single cell of BT, which contains a viable spore that's kind of like a synonymous with a seed from a plant. And there's that beautiful um, uh, crystal shape, that bipyramidal shape, uh, which are the cry proteins. So these are crystal, uh, they're named after the shape, the crystal proteins, which are actually insecticidal proteins that will naturally crystallize within the cell. They're actually produced at such high quantity and at such purity during uh, the fermentation process that it'll just naturally produce these crystals. The primary mode of action uh, is to form pores, which will then uh, inhibit feeding and eventually um, kill the insect. Uh, BTs also contain a viable spore, which as I mentioned is synonymous with a, a seed from a plant. These uh, spores will germinate in the insect gut, uh, not on the plant or in the bag or the bottle. Um, it does contribute to mortality, but as I'll show you later today, the spores themselves are actually not toxic to the, to the caterpillars. There are other uh, soluble synergists, some of them directly toxic, some of them not, uh, to caterpillars. For example, uh, VIP3A, the vegetative insecticidal proteins, has a similar mode of action to cryoproteins, but a very unique target site. Um, it's also soluble and doesn't form those beautiful crystals. There's also secondary compounds that can synergize cryoproteins, like PD100, another name for zwittermycin, and other enzymes and um, uh, other enzymes and byproducts that are produced by the, uh, by the bacteria. So here is uh, just a perfect example of how, how complex these, um, how complex this product can be. So when we consider what actually goes into the sprayable BT, so what goes into the formulated product, it's all of these different components uh, put together. And just to, to sort of, uh, uh, to, to drive that home, this is um, an SEM image of, um, of what the, the components of the commercial BT look like. And if you'll see, there's sort of a rounded, um, uh, there's these, these rounded objects, those are the spores. And if you look closely, you can find um, those, those beautiful bipyramidal crystals um, just spotted throughout. And so in a commercial BT product, uh, we have a very concentrated, um, we have a, a, a very concentrated, um, uh, sorry, a high concentration of, of these spores and crystals, which we're spraying out onto the plant. Obviously you can't see the soluble components here, but this is really the bulk of the products uh, when you look under a microscope. Now BTs are really commonly used um, throughout Asia, throughout the world. Um, and they may in fact be more common than, than you might think for those folks that, that haven't used them before. Uh, for example, uh, BTs are commonly used in cabbage or leafy greens um, as an important resistance management. So that is, uh, as insects become uh, 
intolerant to other insecticides, uh, commercial BTs can still effectively control them. Uh, in the case of pineapples, for example, uh, commercial BTs are used as they do not contribute to um, uh, chemical residues on the fruit, uh, ensuring that there are no issues with um, exporting uh, those produce. In the case of oil palms, there's a really interesting and unique use of BTs to control uh, the bunch moth, a caterpillar that will eat the actual fruit themselves. And in this case, uh, there's an important pollinating weevil. Uh, the targeted activity of these commercial BTs can actually very efficiently uh, control those caterpillar pests, but have no effect on the, uh, the pollinator weevil because they have such a selective um, mode of action. And finally, uh, mosquito control. Um, the commercial BTI, BT, the uh, Israeliensis uh, strains, are actually um, uh, are, are incredibly um, uh, are safe enough to be used um, actually in, in populated areas, uh, in drinking water and things like that to control uh, mosquitoes, uh, the mosquito larvae that can survive in that standing water. So in this way, uh, you know, commercial BTs may be a, a more, more common than you, than you might have thought. And actually, they've been around for a very long time. Uh, so commercial products have been used for more than 50 years. Um, last year, uh, we celebrated, and, and today we're still celebrating, um, the 50th anniversary of Dipel. That's the, uh, the flagship BT uh, Kerstaki strain um, sold by um, Valen Biosciences. It was first uh, registered back in the 1970s. And so today we're celebrating 50 years. And if you think back um, at what, what chemistries were around 50 years ago, um, few, if any of them, have really survived and are in common usage today. And that's because there's been a shift in, uh, in what we want out of, um, out of our pesticides. And um, that shift has really uh, maintained commercial BTs like Dipel uh, into today. And also uh, today we're, uh, we're really distributing more BTs than ever in our history, which just goes to show that, um, uh, that the demand for these lower risk uh, targeted insecticides um, is, is really high and that um, uh, farmers are seeing the efficacy. Now, with respect to fall armyworm, uh, commercial BTs have been used as a tool against fall armyworm in the Americas um, for, really for decades. Uh, the, <coughs> excuse me, the fall armyworm <coughs> is uh, native to uh, Central and South America. And so uh, actually in the, the early applications of commercial BTs in the United States, uh, early applications of Dipel, uh, were oftentimes uh, targeted to corn, where they could be used to control the European corn borer, uh, but also, um, also other um, incidental pests like the fall armyworm. Uh, in Brazil, back in uh, the 2013-2014 season, uh, more than 4 million hectares of corn, cotton, and soybean were sprayed with uh, commercial BTs uh, to combat the invasion of, um, of the uh, Helicoverpa armigera. And so, um, so these, these products are really well known uh, within the Americas to control uh, caterpillar pests in, um, in corn, cotton, and soybeans. And so um, uh, I think by the end of this, uh, this session today and uh, the next one in June, um, I hope you have a pretty good idea about how they'll be able to be used um, effectively uh, throughout Asia. Now, there are a number of common reasons uh, why folks will use commercial BTs. Um, the first is that they, they are effective. Uh, we see consistent efficacy, and if used at the appropriate time and um, at the appropriate rate, they can be similar to chemical controls. They have a low environmental impact uh, as they're safe for beneficials, and also uh, they are a natural part of the environment. BTs are really all around us. They have an excellent worker safety profile, which means it's low risk for applicators. And they're also important for chemical residue management. So there's, there's no maximum residue levels anywhere in the world. And finally, and, and maybe most importantly, in the case of fall armyworm, they're an important tool for resistance management, as uh, commercial BTs have shown no cross resistance with any other insecticide class, uh, period, full stop. It's, uh, it's really remarkable how uh, these products are so different. So you may recognize uh, some of these attributes as things that are important to you, um, but what it really comes down to is that we have this uh, a very effective but natural substance that, um, uh, that represents um, a low risk for applicators and um, has a lot of implications for um, you know, how produce can be, um, can be sold and used. 
Now, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis uh, in agriculture uh, actually gets very specific, so down to the strain level. So what you'll see when you look at a BT label is you'll see that um, all the products are labeled as Bacillus thuringiensis, but there are two subspecies you'll often see. Um, these are the, either the Kirstaki or the Azawai type strains. Uh, now, within these subspecies, there are individual strains and then production strains isolated from those. So when you buy a bag of Dipel uh, or a bottle of, um, of other uh, BT products, it is, it is only a singular microorganism that's in that bottle. Uh, so we produce at um, you know, 100,000 liter scale a single microorganism, um, kind of like you would ferment uh, beer. Uh, you're growing that singular yeast. Now, each production strain has a unique mix of insecticidal components that um, I'll go into more detail with momentarily. And because those, uh, those components can be so different uh, between strains, each one is actually registered as an individual active substance. So the strain ABTS351 is considered a different active substance from the 1857 strain. And that's because those, um, those attributes are so different. And that's another... Uh, uh, that's another reason why we, we really need to understand the complexities of microorganisms and consider them differently than chemicals in that um, each one has its own unique properties, its own unique value. <clears throat> now there are different subspecies um, used for other uses. So for example, we've talked about the uh, Kirstaki and Azawai type strains that are used for caterpillar control. Uh, while there's a subspecies Tenebrionis, the BTT, that's used for controlling beetle larvae. Uh, the BT Israeliensis strain is used for mosquito and black fly control. However, this is very important. Only the subspecies Kristaki and Azawai can be used to control the fall armyworm. Um, oftentimes, in, in, in my experience, uh, there's, there can be a misconception. Uh, about which, which of these types of strains can be used for what types of insects. Um, but if you just keep in mind that only Kristaki and Azawai type strains are effective against fall armyworm, um, you may find the Israeliensis out in the market, but it is not, uh, not at all for this particular use. Now these commercial BTs are actually effective against almost all agronomically important pests. I have here listed out uh, just some of the pests that are on the commercial labels for uh, the Sumitomo chemical products that are available throughout, um, throughout the region. Uh, for example, diamondback moth, uh, nettle caterpillar or a bunch moth on the um, uh, oil palm, as well as um, cotton bollworm, beet armyworm, and of course, fall armyworm. Now there are a number of, um, there's a few insects that are not controlled by commercial BTs. And those are pests that either uh, immediately burrow into, um, into a plant uh, or uh, those that are actually hatched within a plant. And that's because uh, commercial BTs are uh, not systemic. Uh, you saw in that, that image at the beginning, these are just actual crystals and spores, a physical thing. Um, not necessarily a soluble metabolite. And so for that reason, um, they cannot move within the plant and they cannot move across the plant. So uh, the insect will have to eat, um, eat the foliage on the outside to actually ingest um, that commercial BT. And so after that brief introduction, I'd like to just uh, open it up for any, any specific questions. Great, thank you, Daniel. Um, excellent um, initial start there, and there's already lots of questions coming in. I can see Chris is pretty busy, so I may take Excellent. a few questions that Chris has asked as well, just so that everyone has a bit of a discussion on them. I think the first one here was that you mentioned BT are used to manage pests with resistance to chemical insecticides. Mm -hmm. How about resistance to BT proteins? How is that managed? Yeah, so that's actually a very interesting question. Um, it turns out that individual cry proteins, um, as I'll, I'll, I'll kind of describe later, will, can in some cases bind to entirely different receptors. So for example, resistance to one uh, uh, cry protein may not necessarily con uh, confer resistance to another cry protein. And this is really important with respect to genetically modified crops, where um, those crops will often contain um, fewer cry proteins than what you would find in, um, in the commercial BTs. So for example, uh, in Brazil, uh, the intacta soybean uh, contains um, a high concentration of cry1ac. 
uh, which effectively controls most pests, um, but uh, leaves the armyworms um, out in the field. And so in that case, uh, using a product like an Azawai type strain um, can actually effectively control those because um, as I'll show in a minute, the, um, the cry 1C and 1D are so unique from that cry 1AC that they can actually um, control those insects better. So they, they can be complementary. Um, but it, it really does depend on the, the BT crop, um, but they can be complementary um, uh, technologies. Excellent. Here's another question, a good question here. There are various strains of BT in the market. Will it be more efficient for a region to use their indigenous strain or doesn't it have a huge difference between strains? That's also a very good question. Um, the, um, the commercial strains that are being mass produced were specifically selected through um, these screening programs. Um, and I think what, uh, maybe Roma could step in on this one, but I think the, the really important aspect here is, is the regulation of these commercial products. While it may, uh, in some cases, while there may be other better strains out there in the market, um, the regulatory rigor, the required, um, uh, the study that has to go into um, getting a commercial strain onto the market mm -hmm. um, is immense enough that uh, we really have to pick and choose. Yep. Um, yeah, so Dipelins and Tari, for example, are registered in, in 65 different countries. So, so yeah. that means, yeah, it's, it's an immense yeah, no, amount no, of work. Good answer. And actually, I'll just throw that over to Roma. And then after that, we'll move on because there's lots of questions coming through. But I know that some of those questions will be answered further down. Um, and we'll have time at the end and other questions times. Roma, what, your, any feedback on that question? Sorry, could you just repeat the question? The question was, there are various strains of BT in the market. Would it be more efficient for a region to use their indigenous strain or doesn't it have a huge difference between strains? No, no I mean, Daniel's right that, um, so the registration of a new uh, microorganism is going to cost in the region of um, getting up to with product development process and the registration itself, you're looking at a spend that's five million plus. So if you're developing a new strain, you have to think it's better than what's already in the market to justify that kind of expenditure. Yeah. And then from a biological point of view, there's nothing to indicate that the regional co-location of a strain with a pest, it makes it better. What you can have with some microorganisms is their adaptation to temperature. So for example, if you are working in a really dry country and a hot country, you might want a strain that's better in dry and hot conditions. Yep. But a company who's developing the products will know that and they'll filter, filter for that and they'll choose the strain, the right strain for the right conditions where they're planning to sell it. Okay, great answer. Thanks, Roma. Um, Daniel, I'm gonna let you go on because I know that we've got lots to get through and um, you've got okay, some great stuff coming up. Excellent. So next I'd like to talk about the, um, the mode of action of commercial BTs. And so we'll start with a, a video. So uh, commercial BTs work exclusively through ingestion. Um, the caterpillar uh, larvae has to actually consume the crystals and spores. They can't absorb it through their skin. Now these crystals and spores, uh, the crystals will then dissolve in the uniquely high pH of the commercial, uh, oh, sorry, the high pH of the caterpillar midgut. Uh, this releases uh, those cryproteins, which are actually activated by the insect's own digestive system, which is kind of cool. BTs really use the insect against itself. Um, once activated, those proteins will then form uh, these pores, which, uh, when inserted into the membrane, uh, cause the cells along the, uh, the midgut to rupture. This allows um, BT spores and other microbes that are in the stomach to enter the hemocyl or the, um, the insect's bloodstream and will actually kill the insect through uh, sepsis, through blood poisoning. So in fact, um, BTs really colonize the insect from the inside out. It's, it's kind of grotesque, but really fascinating. Um, and if you do find um, intoxicated insects out in the field, um, you'll find these brown shriveled up insects uh, because they've essentially been colonized by all of the, uh, the microbes within, within the bug. Now this mode of action uh, is, um, is quick to stop feeding, um, but slow to kill. So this is a, um, a lettuce feeding assay. So these are treated lettuce leaves uh, with either um, Zentari, that's a BTA product, 
or uh, chlorotrinolipril, uh, the Renaxapir technology. Uh, this is what second, uh, second instar diamondback moth. And if you'll notice in the upper right-hand corner, uh, there is the um, hours or days since application. So I'm gonna start this over again. <clears throat> and what I'd like you to focus on is that even after 24 hours, in both treatments for um, the Zentari and the chlorotrinolipril treatments, uh, insects are still moving around on the leaf surface. However, in contrast to the control, um, they're not feeding. And that's because when, uh, when the cry proteins bind to the stomach and form those pores, it actually neutralizes um, that alkaline stomach and prevents them from being able to, to digest their food, to, to eat anything else. And so for that reason, that feeding cessation will occur very quickly, uh, within minutes to hours after intoxication, while actual mortality, actually killing the insect, um, can take anywhere from a day or two, uh, because that, that complete mode of action of colonizing the insect um, and, and working its way through their system just takes time. Uh, just like it takes us um, a, a few days to get really sick after we catch a cold. And that's important to keep in mind because in the case of uh, chemical insecticides, oftentimes you can go out the next day and look to see if you have effectively controlled your target pest. But in the case of commercial BTs and really biocontrol solutions in general, um, when validating whether an application was effective or not, you really want to um, to give the products sometimes time to, to work and time to control those insects. Now, BT strains have um, a very unique uh, protein profiles. This is by far the most important difference between commercial strains. And that's because these cry proteins are the tip of the spear. This is the primary mode of action of the commercial BTs. Now, you'll notice um, I have here the, the two um, uh, the two commercial strains uh, sold by Sumitomo Chemical. The one on the left is the, um, the Dipel strain, the subspecies Kirstaki uh, ABTS351. And on the right is the subspecies Azawai uh, ABTS1857. And if you look, it's kind of color coded, but on the left hand side, uh, Dipel is characterized by a Cry1AA, 1AB, and 1AC. Uh, these are all relatively similar Cry proteins. It also includes the Cry2AA. Now this uh, this nomenclature uh, it, it looks it looks a bit strange, but it actually denotes how similar these cry proteins are to each other. Um, there are in fact hundreds, if not thousands, of different variants of cry proteins um, that are that have been found in nature. And uh, to to understand uh, the relationship between these different cry proteins, we give them um, a um, uh, we give them these indicator number and letters. So Cry1AA and 1AB are very similar to one another, while Cry1AA uh, and Cry2AA are very different and actually bind to completely different receptor sites in the insect midgut. Similarly, in uh, Zentari, while it does contain the same Cry1AA and 1AB, it uniquely expresses Cry1C and 1D. Now, this, these actual cry proteins, that actually defines really the Azawai type strains. Um, that 1C and 1D also have unique binding sites, not only from one another, but also from the cry 1A type protein. So as I mentioned previously about genetically modified crops, uh, insects that may not be controlled by a cry one ac for example, uh, can be efficiently controlled by the cry one c or cry one d and that's because uh, different pest species actually have variable susceptibility to each protein. I mean, it's truly fascinating. This table uh, on the left-hand side um, shows uh, different pest species. And along the top, um, all of the, uh, the different cry proteins that are in uh, commercial BTs uh, really around the world. Most of them only have these six toxins. Now, as you'll see, uh, the pluses and minuses represent relative susceptibility. Um, a minus doesn't mean that the insect is not susceptible. It just means that it requires a lot more of the material to kill the insect. And if we focus down on the, um, uh, the one on the bottom, the fall armyworm, you'll see that um, while Cry1AB, uh, which is the major component uh, in both uh, the BTK and BTA strains, uh, most BT strains for that matter, uh, can be somewhat effective against this species. Cry1C and 1D are actually acutely toxic to the fall armyworm. And this leads to a very fascinating uh, example of where um, BT subspecies matters quite a bit when trying to control an insect. Um, in general, uh, 
across other insects like um, the Helicover brazea uh, or uh, the uh, cabbage looper, the Trichoplusa knee, uh, generally uh, in Azawai or Kursaki will control them essentially the same. Uh, there's, not, there's not usually significant differences, but there are those rare instances like with uh, Plutella and with uh, Spidoptera species where um, the subspecies makes an important, um, makes an important difference. And, um, and just to, uh, to round it out, the reason for this differential susceptibility is that um, each insect has actually different receptors. Um, and so that just goes to show that there's, there's really uh, the, the importance of the lack of cross resistance between some of these is based on that. Now, this is an example of a, um, uh, this is a study from uh, Laura Becerra and Associates uh, in which um, fall armorworm populations were uh, collected from uh, cornfields across Mexico. So this designation down here um, along the bottom is actually referencing um, co different cornfields across Mexico. On the left-hand side, you'll see that this is the LC95. So the amount of product that was required to kill 95% of larvae in the study. <clears throat> um, and so these, these values can be quite high, but that's only because uh, this is for complete mortality. And you'll notice across the board that um, while both, uh, both Dipel and Centauri were very effective at killing the insects and controlling these, uh, these insects, um, the BTA, Centauri, um, was more effective. And that's because uh, that, um, uh, of the Cry1C and Cry1D. Now, I wanted to show this also because um, it's, it, it really, um, uh, it, it really shows how important it is to respect the uh, application rate on the label. Um, commercial BTs, you'll notice, may have relatively high application rates compared to other chemistries. So you'll be using half a liter of a BT versus, um, you know, maybe only 100 mils of a chemical insecticide. And that's because um, even though the crystals and spores are very concentrated, you really need to get enough of them out into the field to efficiently cover the whole crop to, um, to effectively protect it. And so, especially in the case with commercial uh, BTKs, um, these products can be very effective against fall armyworm. However, it, it is important to respect the application rates. Um, while they may seem high, uh, it's only because um, of, of this unique property where it's, it, it does require slightly more of the BTKs to, um, to control those insects. So just to be clear, uh, both of these products will work against fall armyworm, uh, BTK and BTA. Um, however, there is this slight difference that does give the benefit to commercial BTAs. And I really only know of maybe one other, uh, one or two other examples where this is actually the case. It's, it's quite fascinating. Now, BTs have an entirely unique mode of action, which is really critical for resistance management. Um, so unlike, um, unlike chemical insecticides that will have typically a single target site mode of action, a uh, complex mode of action of BTs means that you have a number of different components that are all working separately. So for example, the Cry1AC, Cry2As will hit different receptor sites and the spores will also contribute uh, hitting um, with a different kind of effect. So commercial BTs are an IRAC group 11 that refers to um, uh, stomach poisons. And actually this is a cross section of a caterpillar. So if you cut the insect, <coughs> if you cut the insect across its body, and this is a, um, a caterpillar that was treated with a Cry1AC that has a, a, red, um, uh, a red label to it. So anywhere that you see the red color is actually where that cry protein uh, bound to the inside of the midgut. So you can see in this case that it's very efficiently covering and will cause all of those cells to swell and rupture. In fact, you can see uh, some of those swells are, uh, some of those cells are starting to swell already. Now this target site is entirely unique from all other insecticides. The only other insecticide that has an effect on the midgut are viruses. And so for that reason, um, using commercial BTs either in a tank mix or rotation can be incredibly valuable in the, wrong run, in the long run to protect, uh, really to protect the, the insecticides that you, you'll need to rely on even for controlling other insects. Um, 
uh, oftentimes uh, some, some insecticides will have a broad efficacy across um, a number of different species. And so even though we may be treating for a different insect, um, the constant exposure of um, uh, constant exposure of the armyworm to different insecticidal mode of actions, um, I'm sorry, to a single insecticide mode of action can eventually um, select for a resistant population. And that's where um, including a commercial BT in your spray program can help to control those insects uh, because there is no known cross resistance between a commercial BT and any other insecticide class which is really fascinating and really unique uh, within insecticides. And this is, um, this is borne out over 50 years of uh, different insecticidal mode of actions being introduced into the market. And so finally, <coughs> excuse me. And so finally, um, the uh, commercial BTs uh, work exclusively against the uh, the larval stage of the caterpillar. Um, uh, sorry, the larval stage of the, the armyworm. They'll have no effect on uh, eggs or on adults. Um, and that's really full stop. The mode of action is through ingestion. And so it is only the larval stage that can really be intoxicated by the commercial BTs. And so that's why, um, uh, that's why um, uh, as we'll discuss at the end of the, the presentation, timing and coverage are just so important when it comes to commercial BTs. And so we covered a lot of ground there. So if uh, anyone has any questions. Yes, uh, Daniel, there's, there's lots of questions. There's already 20 answered. <laughs> so, okay, great. Nice so Chris time. is really uh, probably getting a sore wrist at the moment, I think, a uh, hand there, like it, typing out an answers. But a couple of questions here. Are, BD, are BTs temperature dependent? And what is the temperature range to have the maximum efficiency or efficacy? So interestingly enough, um, the BTs are not temperature dependent. Uh, the caterpillars are temperature dependent. Um, the caterpillars won't eat, uh, won't eat foliage when it's too hot uh, or too cold. And so for that reason, the optimal temperature is when the insect is feeding. Okay. Excuse yes. me. Um, the commercial BTs aren't affected by um, high or low temperatures necessarily, like from the environment. Um, so it's, it's really has more to do with the insect than it does the, the products. Okay, there's another question here around the shelf life. Now you might get, if you're going to cover that later, we can leave it. Um, but there was a question just around what is the shelf life of a BT pesticide, biopesticide? Yeah, so that, that'll be very specific to the product. Um, I think it's, it's probably best that you refer to um, maybe your, the sales rep or uh, the retail who's, who's selling the products to ask them what the specific shelf life is. Okay. Um, with respect to the products that Valent Biosciences sells, um, we have a shelf life of at least two years. Okay. Um, I was fortunate enough to collect some, uh, uh, some of this uh, Dipel DF from our customers in um, Japan, who, you know, oftentimes will think in, in very long term, this product was over eight and a half years old, um, stored in the, you know, temperature controlled um, office. And after eight and a half years, um, still was as potent as the day we sold it. Okay. So stored properly, um, they, they're stored, incredibly stable. Okay, stored yeah. properly. And so I've got a question stored here. Properly. Yeah, which is always probably the case uh, with lots of things. Um, Daniel and, and maybe Roma afterwards, but there's a question here from Andy, um, and thanks for joining us, Andy. Um, it's despite the advantages of BT over chemical synthetic insecticides, one of the concerns is the consistency in their performance under field conditions which are related to the mode of entry through ingestion and the behavior of the larvae, such as fall armyworm, where big larvae tend to live inside the world and are protected. Are there any special efforts to cope or address these problems? So I think the most important efforts that can be focused on, on how to get better consistency is, is twofold. Um, and I'll mention this at the end, but the most important aspects are timing and coverage. A commercial BT will only be effective on the leaf for somewhere between three to seven days, which means that um, you have to time that application perfectly. And that's where um, having, having an organization like this, this, um, this consortium uh, put together by Grow Asia is so critically important to come up with tools that can help us um, understand the life cycle better and time those applications better. 
mm-hmm. I think that's really the number one source of variability in the field is that timing and coverage more than okay. anything. Excellent. Roma, have you got anything to add to that? No, I don't think I can. Um, yeah, Dan, Dan's right. I think one of the things we should always acknowledge by our control agents is they aren't highly toxic and they aren't highly persistent. So you've got to be really good about when you apply them, um, really understanding and monitoring your pest population well so that you get the timing of the application of your biocontrol agent with the timing of the pest. Um, so you have to really be good at understanding that biology. Plus, you have to actually have really good application equipment. So really think about what you're doing, about your spray volumes, mm-hmm. about you, you've got good quality yeah. tanks and good quality applications. And I think actually this is something that Daniel's probably going to touch on in the second part of his mm-hmm. um Okay. In, in about a month's time, isn't it? And, and, and how to actually get the best out of these products in the field and how to use them well. Yep, yep, that's right. And we're hoping to bring some video footage as well of, of actually in the field and, and how to do that, everyone. So hopefully you'll join us in a month's time. Uh, Daniel, if you could continue on, because we, I know we've still got lots to pack in. Sure. So um, I, uh, I'd like to change, um, uh, change directions here and start talking about... Um, the, the importance of quality in commercial uh, biopesticides. Um, now, when you when you think about quality of, of a product, um, I feel like it means something a little bit different in commercial BTs and just biopesticides in general. And that's because we're we're growing a microorganism, which requires very special conditions uh, um, to get really the high potency that we need to be effective in the field. And so, for that reason. Um, the source of that material is critically important. Who grows it, how they grow it, what are the quality controls, all contribute to actually how effective the product is. And so as an example, um, I I was gonna uh, have a demonstration. I don't know if we have time for it, but um, uh, there are uh, available on the market uh, cryoprotein test strips. So these are kind of like, uh, they look very similar to maybe a COVID test that you might've taken. where um, you have uh, on the top here a a positive control band that just says that the the thing is working. And the second band uh, will light up in the presence of a uh, cry protein. And this is really critically important, um, uh, critically important throughout the region uh, because oftentimes low quality commercial BTs um, will have very little cry protein. And as, as we've mentioned a, a thousand times already, the cryoprotein is by far the most important aspect of the mode of action. And a lack of cryoprotein means a lack of toxicity. So we have this tool, um, this is um, these cryoprotein test strips, which um, can very easily be used to, uh, uh, to determine whether a product contains cryoproteins or not. And so I actually have here, I'll just pause this in a second, but I have here a, um, uh, an example of what can be done. And we've, I've sort of done this on the back of a truck before as well. So it's, it's a neat tool that you can really pull out into, uh, uh, you can take out into the environment. Um, how do you stop sharing? I, am I sharing the screen right now? Yep, you are. I am, okay. How, how do you um, uh, stop sharing? Oh, there we go. There we go. How about now? I think it just might just okay. take a little bit of time. Is that working now, Daniel? I can see it. Okay, there we go. Yep. So, so what I have here are these um, uh, cryoprotein test strips. So we get these from, uh, in this case, uh, Romer Labs, but there are a number of different laboratories. These are often used to um, identify the presence of cryoproteins in seeds uh, for those who are interested in growing non-genetically modified uh, crops. Now, I just want to be very explicit. Uh, there are no genetically modified commercial BTs available anywhere in the world. It just so happens that uh, the cryoproteins in commercial strains are so effective that it became really a, a primary insecticidal component in BT crops. They really took it straight from the, the insect. And so what I have here is, uh, this is some, uh, just some water and a, um, uh, uh, this is a, um, what do you call these? A micro centrifuge tube. So one and a half mil tube with a cap. Now it just so happens this cap holds about 100 milligrams of a commercial BT, which is very convenient. So these kits will come with a, um, uh, a buffer, uh, an alkaline buffer. And that's really important because the, 
uh, if you remember correctly, if you remember from before, the um, caterpillar gut is specifically alkaline. And in fact, those cry proteins won't be dissolved. Those crystals will not be dissolved unless they are, um, uh, unless they are uh, dissolved within an alkaline environment. So we can just toss that in there, give it a shake. And when you're doing this, it's actually an interesting, um, it's interesting to watch because this is, um, I have here, this is some of a, a bag of a, a dipel. Uh, from the U.S. market, and um, it's it's kind of hard to see, but there are uh, you can see kind of the product floating in there, and that's because uh, commercial BTs are not soluble. Um, you won't see them completely dissolve into the material, uh, just completely dissolve in the water, because again, the crystals and spores are um, are insoluble. They're they're actually uh, quite quite large. If uh, if a human hair is about a hundred microns wide, then a BT crystal. Is um uh, is about one micron wide, so about a hundred of them side by side will give you um will give you one uh, uh one human hair. So I have here uh, took some of this material. I'll pop in a cryoprotein test strip, and then uh, within a few minutes you have your result as to whether it contains a commercial BT or not. And um, to save time, I actually had run one of these uh, earlier this morning. And as you can see here, uh, the top band is the positive control. Uh, so if it doesn't light up, it's not working. And the bottom band shows a, um, a BT, uh, shows that this, this contains a CRY1A type protein. Um, available on the market today are CRY1 and CRY2 type uh, protein test strips. And what we found with these, using these test strips is that there, there are unfortunately um, fake commercial BTs on the market. Um, either those that are adulterated or those that are of such poor quality that they in fact um, are unlikely to control any caterpillar pests at all. And so having a tool like this, um, having a tool like this can be extremely valuable for um, identifying those products in the market, ensuring that you're getting a good quality product. But it also highlights the importance that unless this product uh, contains the cry proteins, a commercial BT, it will be ineffective. And so there are a number of uh, other uh, watchouts um, to keep in mind when uh, looking for a commercial BT um, on the market. The first is uh, solubility. As I mentioned before, BTs will not dissolve. In fact, um, if you can still see in this image, there might be a little bit of material that's floated to the bottom. And that's actually expected because commercial BTs are insoluble. Um, if a product dissolves completely or if the product is clear to start with, it is not a BT. And that's, that's just, full stop, it's not a BT. Secondly, the speed of action. Uh, insect mortality from a BT can take about 24 to 48 hours. Although larvae will stop feeding immediately. Now a BT claiming quick kill is either adulterated with a, um, an insecticide, or actually some strains are known to contain what's called the beta exotoxin. Um, it's a bacillus toxin that is in fact not allowed in most countries as it's um, acutely toxic to people and uh, can actually cause skin rashes. Um, we're required in most countries to prove that our commercial strains do not produce this. Uh, Non-target toxicity is also an important watch out. BTA and BTK will only affect caterpillar larvae. They will not impact non-target organisms. So if a BT label claims activity against other arthropods like ants or termites, it is not a BT or it's adulterated with another insecticide, uh, which hasn't been listed on the label. So these are just a few things to watch out for um, as uh, I hope that as, um, as biocontrol becomes more mainstream, the kind of um, oversight and regulation uh, that ensures that everyone gets the best kind of products they can, um, you know, uh, gets better over time. Uh, but in the meantime, we, we really have to be vigilant um, and understand. Uh, understand what makes these products work and what makes them, uh, what makes a good quality BT. And so uh, it, I just like to end with the fact that um, uh, growing your own BT, for example, uh, is, is I think something that a lot of folks have thought about. And um, unless you can get the conditions just right, um, there usually isn't enough cryoprotein in just uh, backyard BT to make these products uh, effective in the field. 
um, at the kind of concentrations you're going to want to use them. And so for that reason, um, having a, a really reliable source of commercial BTs is critically important. Now, one, one misconception uh, that I'd, I'd really like to focus on is that spores are, are not the primary mode of action of the commercial BT, but you may actually find it on the label, uh, depending on where you live. For example, on the left-hand side, this is a um, Dipel SC from Indonesia, where you can see that the active ingredient is listed as the BT Kerstaki strain uh, with um, eight times 10 to the seventh CFUs, which is a reference to the number of spores. Uh, there's no other reference to what the active ingredient is. On the right hand side is a Zentari label from Thailand, where uh, the product is labeled in something called DBMU, but also uh, in CFUs. And this is a reference again to spores. Um, now, when uh, I wanted to bring this up because when oftentimes when we're choosing a pesticide to use in the field, we'll oftentimes look at how concentrated it is, how much the active ingredient is there, and then, you know, we can do the math in our head and find out what the best price is. But in the case of commercial BTs, it's really not, uh, the information that's on the commercial labels um, is, uh, sorry, the information on the active ingredient in the product is, is actually a bit um, deceptive. And that's because of the complexity of the organism. Um, when commercial BTs were first introduced, regulators didn't know what to do with them. Um, it's not a traditional active ingredient. There's a lot of different components. And so uh, across the world, um, different regulatory agencies sort of picked at uh, and decided on different things to look at. Um, in some cases, the result was spore count uh, because it's something that's easy for regulators to confirm. Um, however, Comparing spore counts on the label does not mean that a product with more spores is more effective. And that's because it's the crystal proteins. And in nowhere in the world are the cry proteins themselves actually listed on the label. So again, just to be very clear, um, comparing products based on spore counts um, is not a really good way of comparing products. Uh, you'd wanna look at the labeled uh, application rates more than anything. And just as an example, uh, this was an interesting study we just recently done at Valent Biosciences, where um, uh, we essentially took uh, uh, the uh, Dipel DF in that micro centrifuge tube, um, <clears throat> uh, blended it up, and then spun it down. So we had the, uh, the solids, which were collected as the pellet, and then the supernatant, which is the liquid above. And so uh, starting on the left-hand side, this is a, um, uh, a leaf dip assay using um, second instar cabbage loopers. And you can see in the negative control by three days after um, infestation, there's, there's not much left of that leaf. Uh, the positive control here with one gram per liter of Dipel DF um, effectively controls those insects by three days. And this in this treatment, we have both the spores and the crystals because it's the fully formulated product. Now in the supernatant, uh, so this is the liquid above. We still have some spores that won't spin down. And interestingly enough, you can see that they, they do have effects uh, on the insects feeding habits, but they don't kill them at all. Uh, the graph above is a percent efficacy. And you can see that uh, no insects were killed, yet it did seem to have some mild effect on how well they ate. When we then filtered that supernatant, removing any spores that might still be there, you could see we, we returned to that, that basically the same effect as a negative control. And finally, the pellet, so all the solids, the crystals, the spores, any of the soluble proteins, um, that's where all of the activity is. And so even though spores may be on the label, they are not um, a critical part of the mode of action. Uh, I'm sorry, they are not alone uh, insecticidal and therefore not a, good, um, uh, not a good way of comparing BT products. So I... Uh, in summary, what we've talked about today is all the different aspects uh, and the complexity of these commercial BTs with the crystal proteins, the viable spores, and all the other soluble synergies that all work together. And so um, the, the method that was determined to, um, to be the best uh, tool for assessing the quality of a commercial BT uh, was something called the um, uh, international units, which is derived from a live insect bioassay. And so this video here actually shows um, the, the cabbage looper bioassay that we conduct at Valent Biosciences. So we maintain a colony of cabbage loopers, um, actually the same colony for probably nearly 50 years. Um, the, here you can see the eggs are collected. They'll then be hatched um, 
onto a media, and then they'll be infested into uh, media that's dosed with uh, the products. And in this way, um, we can look for the, the LC50, that's the lethal concentration that will kill half the larvae in the treatment. And that will tell us um, the quality of the products. Um, and this results in a metric known as international units. So it's important to note that it's not very common to test um, against a live insect bioassay. This is a quite unique for valent biosciences. Um, however, uh, in most cases uh, around the world, a, a quality control metric has to be uh, correlated back to uh, this, um, this type of study. And this is really important because um, this is really the only way where you can account for all the different metabolites working together is against that live insect uh, itself. And so international units or IUs are, are truly a unique way of measuring VTs, um, but most importantly are not related to field efficacy. I, I wish I could tell you that there's a lot of important information here on the front of the label under active ingredient, but it is for the most part very deceptive. Uh, those international units are only based on a laboratory bioassay against an inbred population of cabbage loopers, only cabbage loopers. It does not reflect efficacy in the field as this is an inbred population. And it also does not reflect efficacy against any other species as the only thing that can be called international units are, um, are against cabbage loopers. And finally, uh, this metric then is really only used for quality control to test the complex mix of crystals, spores, and synergists. And so again, when comparing commercial BT products, you might notice some on the market which have uh, potencies of 16,000 international unit. Another product that may have a potency of 30,000 international units. And in fact, those products may be just as effective in the field. Um, what will matter more in the case of fall armyworm is the specific blend of cry proteins, something that just isn't on the label, which is really unfortunate. Uh, the information that's on the label here about the active ingredient um, just doesn't give you a really good idea about what's in the bag or what's in the bottle. And so using spore counts or using um, this biopotency, these international units to compare BT products and make a choice about which one you wanna use um, is actually uh, not the way to go. What you really wanna think about is um, the reputation of those, of those commercial products and uh, the reliability that you see yourself. So, uh, so when choosing a, a label that you may not recognize, something new on the market, it's important to look into the reputation of the company manufacturing those products um, because the quality controls are so important uh, to make sure that you have that high concentration of um, cry proteins. Um, so again, it, it, it's unfortunate, but um, there, there's really not a lot of information on the label except application rate that can be used to compare across uh, application rate and subspecies, of course. And so I could pause there for uh, questions yeah, again. Great, Daniel, and lots of questions still coming in. Um, so yeah, people obviously got, got a lot to ask here. Um, I, a couple of questions and maybe I can join one or two into one question, um, mm -hmm. but it was really about the, the access to these test strips, the cost of them, and um, also a, would it be smallholder farmers doing this or do you think it's it's more realistic that if officials or extension agents or regulators would be doing that type of thing? I mean, how, how realistic is it for smallholder farmers to be? To be yeah, no, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's so realistic. Um, I think I wanted to just show this. Uh, no, no, it's our, very good. But I was just wondering, I think people are very interested in it. I mean, I think you would see maybe extension agents having exactly. access to that and understanding what, what they're doing, I guess. And how much is the cost of that? So we, we buy them in a special, uh, the special small pack that they made for us. And I think it's about two or three dollars per strip. They're not they're not cheap, for sure. Yeah. Um, but they're they're an important tool. Okay, excellent. Now we're just going to go down into maybe a few more technical questions here around um, when, well, firstly, I'll, I'll ask this question, any results of BT for controlling rice leaf fodders or stem borers? Is BT effective? I think Chris might have um, direct experience with this one. Um, we do have efficacy against the leaf folder. But I believe the stem borer is where we get into, uh, we, we have that issue of the insect um, boring too quickly and not eating the outside of the leaf. Uh, so that's an example of where um, 
the the habit of the insect uh, is really important because okay. again, BTs are not systemic and are not um, they can't move into the plant. Okay, so that leads into another question that's quite common: is like for the fall armyworm, when are you wanting to? When's the best timing to sort of apply this? If it's if it's the caterpillar, um, what stage and when? Absolutely. The best timing for fall armyworm is as close to hatch as possible. Okay. The first and second instars are the most susceptible. So when the caterpillar is so small, it's hard to see. Um, and so that's where it, uh, scouting and having models that, that are reliable um, can be so important. So uh, when pheromone traps are available, if they are available, using them to keep track of whether the moths are, are flying into your fields mm -hmm. can be really valuable. Um, because just understanding when that, that brief period in the first and second instar, that's, that's when you want to target the application. Okay, great. And I know we'll talk about that a little bit further and as a bit of a pre-taste uh, um, for the, the session in, in June. So, so we'll come back to that, probably the specific application and, and ideas around that. But here's another question. Is there any relation between water quality and the BT efficacy? So that's something we'll cover uh, in, the, in the next uh, presentation. There's a little bit in this one, uh, but the uh, water quality actually uh, uh, apparently has a very little effect on the commercial BTs. Okay. Um, there are examples where um, the, the cry proteins are alkaline soluble. Um, and so there are regions I know where uh, the, um, uh, where BTs are applied for uh, the, uh, the bunch moth. Uh, and in those cases, the water can be extremely alkaline. Now, our, uh, the VBC commercial formulations actually do a very good job of buffering the water. Um, however, um, checking the tank pH um, after uh, introducing the BT is very important because okay. if the water does remain alkaline, it'll actually dissolve those crystals and make them ineffective in the field. So that's really the most important aspect. Okay, and we'll talk about that further, but that's that's a good um, good taste of what's to come as well. Uh, another question here, a more generic question around, are BT proteins allowed in organic agriculture globally? Absolutely. Uh, and this, this is that, that misconception of the overlap of GMOs and, and commercial BTs. Uh, the commercial BTs are the natural source of cry proteins. Yep. Uh, most of the VBC formulations are in fact organic certified, uh, including the one that I tested today. Okay, great. Now I'm gonna let you carry on because I just, we, we, we're, we're tight, a little bit tight on time. Not, not really, we're actually perfectly timed actually with 510. So, but I wanna leave a bit of time at the end, Daniel, because I know that there's quite a few questions still coming in. Um, and what I'm quite keen is you're gonna give a bit of a taste, a little bit of the information which is gonna come up in the next session. So this will also probably raise a few questions. So um, if you carry on and then we'll have a bit of time at the end for finishing all the questions that come up. And thanks for all the great comments, everyone that are, that's coming in as well. Absolutely. Okay, so what I'd like to end with are, um, what are the two most important aspects for um, getting good field efficacy with a commercial BT, and that's timing and coverage. A BT retain their peak activity for only three to seven days. Excuse me, so timing is critical. Targeting early instars is extremely important, especially with borers uh, before they become inaccessible to the product, like the rice stem borer we talked about. If not already a common practice, regular scouting uh, can only be beneficial for all aspects of crop protection, but especially for getting that, that application timing just right. And that's where, as I mentioned before, having access to predictive models whenever possible uh, to time that application is, is really extremely useful. Um, we've, we've uh, as VBC, we've helped to develop some of these models, for example, um, for, the, um, uh, for the sugar cane borer in Brazil. Um, and being able to, 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 map, the, um, to map the moth flights uh, in your own field um, can allow you to time that application so precisely uh, in, the, in the case of that particular insect that even a commercial BT, which as Roman mentioned, um, these products are, are, are usually less toxic than, than these, um, the traditional chemistries. Um, but getting the timing just right means that even the slightly less toxic uh, pesticide can be just as effective. And uh, this is a, a study from um, uh, so Mato Grosso State in, uh, in Brazil. 
Um, along the left-hand side of the table, you see these are first through fifth instars. And across the top are different um, caterpillar species, in this case, collected from the field with a um, application rate of a product, uh, I believe this one was Zentari, at either 400 or 600 grams per hectare. <clears throat> Uh, the boxes that are in green indicate 95 to 100% uh, control. So that means all of the insects uh, of that instar were killed. And anything in red means less than 70% mortality. And so as you can see very clearly, first and second instars um, across the board are the most acutely susceptible to commercial BTs. After that, it becomes very specific to the insect. For example, on the far left-hand side, the Chrysodexis includens, which is the, um, the soybean looper, um, is actually is, is, uh, can be affected by commercial BTs up until the fifth instar later in their life. Well, in the case of uh, the fall armyworm on the right-hand side, in this case, a population from Brazil. So of course it can vary from location, even vary from field, to be honest. It was up until the third instar where um, the commercial BT could effectively control that insect. So this just goes to show how important it is to time that early application. And also, uh, when you are scouting in the field and you find mixed populations, um, keeping that in mind that the commercial BT will control the early instars, but not necessarily the later instars, may inform uh, whether you use different rotation partners or different tank mix partners. And secondly, uh, one most, the second most important aspect of field efficacy is coverage. And this is because BTs are not systemic. Coverage is critically important to protecting foliage and maximizing the value of every application. Only foliage that is directly sprayed is protected, full stop. Uh, for best results, it's, it's best to ensure full coverage with the lowest reasonable volume. Um, oftentimes we use this kind of catchphrase of spraying until the foliage is dripping, but not excessive runoff. Um, if the water doesn't stay on the plant, neither does the product. And higher volumes may be necessary under heavy pest pressure to ensure complete coverage. Um, this is where uh, it may be important to use higher volumes if the insect is moving into the leaf whorl to ensure that you get enough accumulation of the commercial BTs in that leaf whorl. And this is just a taste um, of, of what we'll discuss in the next, uh, the next session, uh, which will be coming up in, uh, in June. Uh, in, that in that session, we'll talk about um, really where the rubber hits the road, uh, when to apply uh, based on scouting, so using scouting to make decisions, um, storage, handling, and PPE, application equipment, rates, spray volumes, uh, tank mix compatibility, how to apply the products, and then how to verify efficacy. These are all things that we'll cover in the next session, and so I really hope you'll join us for that session as well. And I'd like to end with what I, I think are you know, maybe the, the most useful top 10 considerations for using BT in the field. Um, I, I wanna say read through all of these, um, but it kind of highlights some of the things I've talked about and also some things that we'll talk about next time. For example, um, or hit them early, making applications against early instars. Um, watching the tank pH, number five, uh, is important because if the tank is alkaline, it'll ruin the product. Um, tank mixing can normally be okay with insecticides, fungicides, and other additives. And uh, number nine, I think is, is one of the, the most important misnomers, is that BT, uh, they'll actually last for a few days. So they can be applied uh, day or night. Um, I know some folks uh, will only apply a BT at night thinking that um, it makes a really big difference, but in reality, actually it doesn't make that much of a difference. So I'll leave this up for a minute in case uh, you want to copy it, but um, that, that ends my presentation. And so um, um, I'd like to take any more questions and I, I truly appreciate all of your uh, uh, attention. Yeah, Daniel, that is fantastic. And um, at perfect timing, which I knew you, you would uh, do. <laughs> Uh, it's always a difficult. It's always difficult, everyone, when you're when you're a moderator, um, to always get the timing right. But it's fantastic when you have a speaker that uh, has definitely prepared very well. Um, and I really enjoyed your uh, live demonstration there. By the way, very good multitasking. Um, so uh, congratulations on that. Um, quite a few questions here, uh, and you've got lots of good uh, lots of good feedback, Daniel. That's been coming through in the chat too. Just to just to tell you that. Um, 
uh, th this question's come up and I know you answered this, but it's it's come up a couple of times uh, and still coming up. So I thought it would be good just to go back on it. And it's really around why you have to get it and get them in those early instars. So why is there less mortality in the fourth and fifth instar? And I, and I know you addressed this, but it would be good just because I can see it's coming up a few times. Let's just go over yeah. it and just make sure everyone's really clear around what's happening here. No, it makes sense. And actually, it's it's the same. It's the same reason why, um, you know, most. I think if you read the labels of of most insecticides, for the most part, um, the suggestion is always to target early instars, and that's just because of concentration effect. Um, a higher so uh, a um, a small larvae really is just much smaller and has to consume less material um, to get a lethal dose. Um, a fourth or fifth instar larvae that eats um, just a normal application rate of commercial BTs, um, while it may cause damage, make them sick, make them lethargic, actually, interestingly enough, offset them in the reproductive cycle so they won't necessarily be able to, um, to mate with the next uh, generation, mm -hmm. um, but they'll still survive because they can, um, they can just outgrow and survive the, the effects on their stomach. Yep. And again, that goes for really all insecticides. Um, the bigger the insect, the more it takes to kill them. And uh, in the case of BTs, uh, you can poke um, a few holes in a small larvae and have a significant effect, but that same number of holes in a, a much larger larvae um, will make them sick, but won't kill them necessarily. Yeah. Excellent. And so here's a here's another question that comes through a lot too. So and thanks for that answer. Um, makes sense and actually very interesting as well. Uh, different generations as well and the impact there. Um, here's a question here, and there's two parts to this. Firstly, can BT products be mixed with chemical insecticides to kill larvae, eggs, and adults all together? And then the second one, could it be mixed with fungicides? And are there any exceptions? Yeah, so there's um, there's really two considerations, and that's um, the effect that um, that these products will have on the proteins themselves. So strong oxidizers um, should not be mixed with commercial BTs because they can degrade the proteins. There's some fungicides that are just very strong oxidizing agents. That being said, uh, most uh, insecticides are not. And so actually commercial BTs appear to be, um, of course, I can only speak for the ones that we've tested, uh, but we've tested quite a few at, uh, at VBC over the years. And um, there's, there's no uh, incompatibilities there. Um, in fact, it's, it's really beneficial to mix, uh, to mix commercial BTs with other insecticides, uh, because again, it, it probably is likely there will be mixed populations in the field. So getting effective control may require an additional um, an additional step, having something else. Uh, so generally speaking, there's uh, tank mix compatibility across the board. Um, that goes for uh, the, the chemical compatibility, uh, physical compatibility of the formulations uh, should always be tested separately in a, a jar test. Um, so mixing the amounts in a, in a jar and then looking for just physical incompatibilities is important. Yeah. Okay, good. And, and here's a question here as well around once you've sprayed the BT products on the plants, will the BT start to propagate? Does it have any antagonism on the surface microbial composition, the leaf surface, which could lead to other problems? Now, interestingly enough, uh, commercial BTs for the most part are, are so, they are so specific to this ecological niche within the insect that they, they, they almost never grow in the environment. Um, I met a, um, a researcher recently who had applied uh, commercial BTs to a field. It was once 20 years prior. And every few years he would go out in the field and um, test the, the population of the commercial BT that he could find in the soil. And what he found is that after, uh, after something like 20 years, um, at most, there had maybe been a few generations uh, of outgrowth of the commercial BTs. So they really, they really don't grow very well in the environment. Um, their preferred environment is inside the caterpillar. Um, so they're not going to grow on produce. They're not going to grow in the bottle. Um, so if you see a bottle inflate or something like that, it's not because the BT is growing. It's because there's something else in the bottle. Um, and they're, they're not really gonna grow in the soil. They won't necessarily accumulate in the soil or anything like that. Um, they're just, they're so hyper-specific to caterpillars that it's really the only place they efficiently grow. Yeah. Oh, 
Okay, excellent. Very interesting. And, and here's one, I forgot a question coming in here around, you say the IU cannot be used to determine the bioefficacy of VT products, but how should we, how should we do that then? Yeah, it's, it's not, a, I, I'm very sorry, it's not a very satisfying answer, but um, it, reputation and experience is really the best way. Um, we do have tests uh, for quantifying the amount of cry protein in a product, but it's, it's not very common. Yeah. Um, so really it's, it's knowing where you're, where you're getting these BTs from, yeah. um, having a, a, a label that you can trust. Um, it's, it's unfortunate this is how it is, but, um, yeah. uh, but this is just how the industry is regulated. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Daniel, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to, I'm going to ask Roma probably the, the same question or to add to it um, for sort of the last uh, kind of question. And I guess this is a question around, we've got a lot of smallholder farmers uh, in this region, making up the bulk probably of the farming community. I mean, how uh, cost effective is this uh, as a form of control for army worm and, and how accessible is it to smallholder farmers in this region at the moment? Not to say that there may be opportunities to make it more accessible, and I think that's what we're trying to do through the biocontrol program, but what's your thoughts on that for now? Uh, Roma, did you want to comment? Oh, sorry, I thought it was to you, Daniel. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, I don't know. Let's, let's, let Roma go, let's let Roma go first. <laughs> yeah. it's probably... Sorry, I was waiting for you, Daniel. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a difficult question because I think as Daniel has pointed out, what's really important with microbials um, and, and to be honest, any plant protection product, the quality of that plant protection product is important. Mm -hmm. And there used to be this concept that biocontrol agents can be produced cheaply and easily and everybody can do it on their farm. And the truth is it, you can't, they're much more complex than that. It's much harder to maintain the quality. It's hard to maintain that you've got no contaminants in there. Um, so you, I think we would need to sort of move away from that concept of them being microorganisms being a sort of cheap solution for crop protection. But what they are is when you've got a good quality product is that they are effective and used well. So I think some of the ways in which smallholders can um, save money is to be, to get good information about how to use the product so that when they use them, they're using just what they need is applied at the right time and getting the most out of it. Yeah. I think to mechanisms to make them available is something that governments need to think about in their policies if they have a particular focus on smallholder farmers. Yeah, excellent answer. Thanks, Roma. Did you want to add anything to that, Daniel? Or did you want to add anything else that 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 comes to mind for your last yeah, I think of, I, uh, statement? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I think the only thing I would add is that, um, is that the, um, with, with respect to this particular question, um, is that this is where tank mixing can, can make, um, mm. can make the application of a biopesticide more cost effective. And oftentimes, um, how commercial BTs really get out in the field when cost is an important issue. Um, but what I'd like to close with is the fact that it, it is important to find ways to introduce um, if not commercial BTs, other biopesticides into, um, into the control of fall armyworm in general. Yeah. Um, resistance is a huge issue. It's going to be a huge issue. Um, we know this in the Americas, um, and I believe even some of the resistance that was already inherent within the insect, it carried along with it into, um, into, into Asia and into Australia. And so um, having different tools and using those different tools together is, um, is really at the heart of having a good and effective control program. And I think BTs are an especially good tool just because of how unique they are um, and because of the other value that they really bring to, um, to the um, uh, to the field. Yeah, that's a brilliant. Just to add, yep. Go yeah, and just to add to that, I mean, this is the whole, this is the aim of the um, WHAFAO Fall Army Worm Project that the way to manage this pest is an integrated pest management approach. There isn't, there isn't a single solution. It's about layering all the solutions together. You've got really good monitoring. You really understand the biology of the pest. And then you look yep. at all the tools that you've got available and you use those tools well. And, um, but, uh, using them at the right time, but just what you need at that right time. So it, you know, 
yeah, Daniel, this is about integrated pest management. Um, I think the days of sort of, you could spray something and walk away and forget it are long gone now. Um, it, <laughs> you, we've got to have a much more integrated approach to crop protection. Excellent. Thanks, Roma. And, and thanks, um, Daniel. Brilliant presentation. R very um, uh, comprehensive. And I'm really looking forward to the next presentation coming up. Based on this one, it's going to be fantastic. Um, really like your enthusiasm as well, I have to say. Um, you know, it's, it's quite nice to see the beautiful crystals. <laughs> you almost have quite a passion there <laughs> explaining uh, some of the uh, more technical stuff of, of the product and, and how it's used. So thank you very much. I'm just going to end your bit here. And what I'm going to do is just ask Fung um, Chong from uh, Caddy just to close, uh, provide some closing thoughts and a summary. And, and while you're doing that, I'm going to share my screen and just get back to the presentation. Fung, if you could um, unmute yourself and, and I'll hand it over to you. Oh, thank you, Edison. Uh, congratulations, Daniel, uh, for your excellent presentation. I'm uh, very impressed uh, with the with the <laughs> the information you provided. Of course, this also always also reminded me. Uh, Ten years ago, I was working on BT in DPR Korea. We tried to produce BT with the semi-solid uh, fermentation method, <laughs> as you mentioned. Uh, quality is really an issue. Uh, contamination, you know, you can win. You can imagine with the semi-solid fermentation, it's much more difficult to control uh, the quality. Uh, but even with that, I was I was still, you know, uh, re remembered uh, how successful, you know, with the with the products to to spray uh, by farmers uh, in the field to control uh, diamond back moss at that time, you know. Uh, now we are going to work on the full armyworm in the region, particularly. Uh, I, I see. Uh, I don't want to repeat that you have already mentioned the timing, the you know this quality, uh, how important, uh, and also how to select the right species during uh, all these factors. You have very give, have given a very good summary. Uh, I like it very much. Uh, actually, I'm eager to to see the next presentation next next time. You know, uh, Edison organized you in the room. Uh, that's a little bit long, I would say. Uh, we should shorten this if it's available. You know. <laughs> So to use the momentum, you know. So and also I I, I, I see how influencers stick from the participants uh, to uh, to to, uh, to look forward to see this uh, to to use the BT or to to apply this in the field. Uh, I see the questions and the very uh, typical questions comes from the region. Uh, I do thank the group uh, from Daniel from Valiment and also Ro Roma uh, to give very uh, uh, crisp answers to each questions. Uh, thank you all <laughs> uh, for this excellent work. Uh, from KB side, I would also uh, like really to add our thanks also to, uh, to Alison and the Guru Asia to organize such a uh, wonderful uh, event for us. Uh, with that, I would like to, yes, uh, to finish. I hand over back to Alison, please. Excellent. Thanks, Fang. And, and thank you for the summary of your key messages and the enthusiasm. We do need to leave a little bit of a gap to the next uh, webinar because we really want to get into the field and actually yeah. get some video. Uh, so that's why there's a bit of time. So sorry for the wait, but uh, people can um, anticipate that it will be a very good session. Uh, big thank you to Daniel, Chris, uh, Valent Biosciences, Sumitomo for your preparation and support of the webinar. Uh, also, thank you very much, Roma, for joining us uh, as well. It's um, very good to, to have you and, and to have your um, input. Uh, looking forward to seeing you on the June 30th. So thank you very much for, um, for joining us today. And thank you for all your questions. We have a lot of questions there. Um, we will post a copy of the PDF and, and a copy of this video uh, online within the next week. Um, just remember you have other sessions. Um, so please sign up. You can see that on um, our events page. We do have a biocontrol regulatory masterclass, um, particularly if you're working in government around regulation. We would love to see you there. Um, so you can contact me if you'd like more information on that as well. Um, so that really draws us to a close today. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, Cabby, for, for doing this together with us again. Uh, we really appreciate your support. So um, take care, everyone. Um, have a safe couple of months and we'll see you back in June. Thank you.
stop the recording.